Hi there, everyone. Today, I'm thrilled to introduce you all to Dr. Ted Naiman. Dr. Naiman is a board certified family medicine physician at a major medical center in Seattle. And he focuses on research into how to use diet and exercise to optimize our health. So Dr. Naiman has written what I think is the best practice practical nutrition book I have ever read. Um, it's called the PE diet, which is protein to energy diet. And I'm going to let him explain it in more detail to you. But for those who know me, I've always been a fan of prioritizing protein in our diets. And this question answers, this book answers all those questions for you about how much we should be eating and our ratio of fats and carbs and so on. It's also a beautifully illustrated book. Dr. Naiman drew all the illustrations himself. And for visual learners, I think um, this makes the concepts really easy to grasp. So I highly recommend this book. I'd love to see everyone in the country following the principles outlined. Dr. Naiman has a website called Burn Fat not sugar, and you can buy a PDF of this book from there, and it's also on Amazon. He's also very active on Twitter and Facebook, and we'll put all the links as to where you can find him in the show notes and on the website. So Dr. Naiman, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, wow. Thank you for having me. Great, great pleasure. Um, so I was just wondering, would you start by giving us your backstory and filling people in on who you are and, and why you decided to write this book? Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. I would love to. So uh, I got a mechanical engineering degree undergraduate and uh, then I couldn't get a job. <laughs> so I was pretty much a failure at mechanical engineering, mostly because uh I'm here in the Pacific Northwest and Boeing, the uh, aerospace industry here, laid off a bunch of mechanical engineers the year I got out of school. So nobody in my class could get a job. And I, I didn't really know what to do with myself. And just kind of on a whim, I went to medical school. And it was really just the absolute last minute decision ever. I applied on the last day you could, and I never even took general biology. And so the next thing I know, I'm in medical school. Well, I was raised a Seventh-day Adventist. My mother's a Seventh-day Adventist. And so I was a vegetarian for off and on pretty much 20 years. And I was raised vegetarian. I went to vegetarian Adventist schools and I went to a vegetarian medical school, Loma Linda University, which is in Southern California, east of Los Angeles. And some people might recognize Loma Linda as being one of these famous quote unquote blue zones where everybody lives a long time and everyone's, you know, on a plant-based diet and all this kind of stuff. So I went to school at Loma Linda. I had a vegetarian um, background and upbringing and I'm at this vegetarian school. And uh, then I did my residency in uh, South Carolina. And at the time it was the number one state in the United States for uh, a whole bunch of bad things, including obesity and type two diabetes and heart attacks and strokes and all sorts of metabolic disease. So I, I saw tons of extremely severe type two diabetes and complications and obesity and insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. And so from very early on, I adopted uh, a large interest in the uh, type two diabetes spectrum of diseases, metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance and obesity and the various diseases that were associated with insulin resistance. Now, in medical school, they kind of taught us about diet, but the general thought was, well, you should, you should eat a vegetarian diet because it's healthy and it's the right thing to do ethically and morally, but diet's not very powerful. And so the message for us was that people who have diabetes 
Uh, it's mostly genetic. You have diabetes because your parents had diabetes. And, you know, if both your parents are obese, there's an 80% chance you'll be obese. And if both your parents are diabetic, there's an 80% chance you'll be diabetic. And it's really just bad genetics, and we should feel sorry for these people. And, yes, of course, they should eat a healthy vegetarian diet because it's just the right thing to do. But it's really all about the medication, right? So here are the drugs you put people on when you have diabetes and then they will inevitably get worse. And then, then you put them on insulin and this is how you gradually increase the insulin doses higher and higher and higher. And these are the complications you can expect from diabetes. And then you, you know, 75% of diabetics die of giant heart attack. And that's just how it goes. And so this was kind of the angle I was coming at it from. I was told that, um, all diabetics are going to get worse and you just have to kind of feel sorry for them because it's not their fault because they had this bad genetics and that's just the lot they were dealt in life. And uh, you just uh, titrate their insulin doses higher and higher. And uh, I personally was never really in great health. I never really had very good health or body composition. So internally, I felt that Diet was not a very powerful lever for health because I was allegedly on the healthiest diet that you, somebody could have and my health kind of sucked. And so diet was just sort of a meh for me. And then I think what really caught my attention was a patient, a type 2 diabetic patient of mine in my internship. And this was, you know, 20 years ago now or more than this was 22 years ago. And this patient... I was so used to having patients come in who had just gotten worse and worse and worse, right? Gaining weight, uh, higher blood sugars, higher hemoglobin A1Cs, more diabetic neuropathy, retinopathy, nephropathy, all these complications and problems. And one day someone came in and, and uh, I, I looked at the patient, I looked at his chart and I was like, wow, you just lost 30 pounds and your blood sugar is normal. And this guy was like, yeah, I feel awesome. I've never felt this good. Uh, I, I even stopped taking my medications. He had normal blood pressure, normal blood sugar. Uh, he felt great. And I asked this guy, what the hell did you do? Because I have to know so I can tell other people to do whatever it is you did. And he, he throws down a copy of the, uh, you know, the original Dr. Atkins book, Dr. Atkins Diet Revolution. And he's like, oh, I just read this book. And it told me to not eat carbs, and that's what I did. And um, next thing you know, I'm just not that hungry. I lost all this weight. I feel awesome. And so I, I went to my instructors in internship, and I said, you have got to see this guy. He totally changed his diet, and he feels awesome, and all this great stuff happened. And they just kind of looked at me and said, uh, hmm, well, what happened to his total cholesterol? And I... <laughs> admitted that I, oh, I didn't even really look. I didn't even notice. I didn't, you know, I, and they're like, oh, well, go, go look. And sure enough, his total cholesterol had gone up, you know, 10 or 20 points. And they're like, oh, great. He probably died of a heart attack in the parking lot. And you're the worst doctor ever and way to go. And under no circumstances are you allowed to recommend this sort of diet for anyone ever at all, period. Goodbye. And so, that really got me thinking, you know, what, what is going on here? You know, why is this single dietary intervention so powerful? And why is it that absolutely everything you could measure subjectively or objectively got better for this person, except for his total and LDL cholesterol? And I just spent the next 20 years researching the implicate, I mean, the, the impact of diet on health and specifically macronutrients on diet and health. And so I've just been researching the heck out of this my entire career. And uh, it's just been hugely interesting to me, both personally and professionally. And I have been recommending at least some degree of carbohydrate restriction for a lot of my patients uh, ever since then. And that's, that's pretty much the story. That's how I got to where I'm at. And that's, that's what brought me to write the book and to be in the position where I'm at currently. Oh, it's a fascinating story. And it's really great to be talking to a vegetarian or an ex-vegetarian. And, you know, um, because 
you know, as you say, um, that university produces so much of the research and publications about diet and has a huge influence, doesn't it, on how oh, yes. you diet? The Adventists are, uh, I mean, they, they're basically just a huge plant-based propaganda machine. And uh, everybody has heard about them and their message and their brands of food and what they've done to, you know, breakfast cereal, for example, uh, with Kellogg and all that sort of thing. Um, it's really pretty far reaching stuff. And it, it shapes a lot of what everyone thinks and believes in the nutrition world. The Adventists are actually very good at education and they really have a lot of tentacles into uh, the educational system and they kind of spread this plant-based message more than anybody else. They, they basically originated it. It's very, very interesting. Yeah, they have a, um, or have had up until recently a great influence on the medical fraternity in New Zealand and Australia as well. And, you know, GPs would basically hand out sanitarium's um, food guidelines to patients. Sanitarium. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sanitarium is, is huge down there. And uh, it's basically this, all this Adventist plant-based propaganda that started with Ellen G. White, you know, having a, a vision that humans shouldn't eat animals because it was wrong somehow. It's just really, really, really interesting where it all came from and where we ended up with the plant-based thing. Yeah, well, I think, you know, I've shared the masturbation cornflakes story. Um, mm -hmm. Pretty amusing, yeah, it's you know. <laughs> very fascinating. It's it's fascinating, and I personally and professionally think that breakfast cereal is probably the single most evil thing ever when it comes to the diabetes epidemic, because you're literally eating this incredibly high glycemic thing first thing in the morning with a ridiculous glycemic load and glycemic index and, and essentially no protein at all. And it really just sets your metabolic tone for the whole rest of the day. I mean, this just starts people off on this unbelievable carbohydrate roller coaster. So I have a super deep hatred for breakfast cereal. Like, like that's my least favorite. Uh, it, breakfast. I mean, soda's evil. Yes, I, I'm, I would. I would say that soda's probably more evil, and sugar sweetened beverages are probably more evil. But breakfast cereal is bad. It might be worse because it has this health halo, right? It's yeah. so healthy. I mean, it has no saturated fat or cholesterol. It's heart healthy. I mean, it says so right on the label. So, so here you have a food that's actually got a health halo, and people will go out of their way to eat Cheerios or some crap if, they, if they're trying to get healthy. That, some people would think that's a healthy thing to do, and it's just not, it's not that good. And it's fed to the kids too. Like we're we're shoving this stuff down our kids' throats as well. And you know, oh, yeah. this exploding childhood diabetes and childhood obesity. Um, and I think parents don't realise shoving this cereal down their kids' throats not really such a good thing. No, I mean they actually assume that's one of the healthiest things they can give their kids, and it's uh, it's terrible.